Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, everybody. My name is Danny, and I'm an alcoholic. That's the best news I got for you tonight, man. Uh, it's really nice to be here. What a great, what a great meeting hall. What a great group, and a nice tradition of flying speakers in. I, oh, I had to get up at 4:30 in the morning to get here, but it was worth it. I'll tell you that. And I want to thank Mark, Mark, and his boy Gabriel for hosting me. Uh, <laughs> They picked me up at the airport. We went and had a fabulous lunch. We just had a fabulous dinner. I went into the men's room to, uh, to the men's room (laughs) and undid my pants and the button popped off and went right in the toilet, you know, so that's how good I've been treated up here. I think I'm spoiled already. (laughs) Let me do what's important though. I'm sober through the grace of God and the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous. That's why I'm here tonight. And, uh, you know, before 1935, they said, sorry, you're an alcoholic. There's not much we can do for you, if anything. man." And then Bill Wilson and Dr. Bob came along. And today, can you imagine if we were all drunk in the same place at the same time? So it's amazing that mi- millions and millions of people have benefited from these two men, you know, and Last year, I was invited back to uh, Founders Day with a friend of mine who was, uh, he actually spoke there, and we got off the plane, and they took us right to Dr. Bob's house. We had a private time alone, and we walked in the back door, and we sat at that kitchen table where Bill and Bob sat. I mean, the original pot of coffee, I mean, this... I just sat down and wept like a baby, you know. I mean, it was, uh, I was so grateful for the life that I have today that I was willing enough to let you guys show me how to live. You know, I had no idea how to live. And I'll tell you a funny story. That, that friend of mine that spoke there was a, he's a famous musician. I should, I'm a musician, too. That's what I do. If you can't tell already, you know, that's the goofy side of me. But um, I'd, sp- I'd spoken in... Uh, in West Virginia, I believe, years ago. And there was a fellow there on the taping committee who who was from Akron's uh, committee for the speakers. And he says, wow, you give a great talk. One of these years, we're going to get you to speak at Founders Day. Yeah, right. You know, like, it's a million people that can do a better job than I can. So uh, a couple of years ago, I get a phone call from somebody on the speakers committee at Founders Day. You know, I said, Wow, this is pretty good. Maybe, maybe, you know, maybe this is my time, you know. So uh, he says, we're not looking for a speaker for this year, but we're looking for a speaker for next year. Could you put us in touch with Joe W.? (laughs) (laughs) There was my ego. (laughs) Well, they say ego smashed. Well, well, that smashed me. But uh, anyway, I talked my buddy into doing it, and we went back there and just had the time of our lives. And... uh, they're making good, and they asked me to speak next year at Founders Day, so I'm just so excited and so thrilled, you know. Uh, I should tell you my sobriety date is January the 2nd, uh, 1991, so I'm coming up on 28. Uh, I should tell you uh, I'm married to the same woman for 52 years. <laughs> She doesn't know any better. She's French. (laughs) Uh, My poor wife. (laughs) What we put these women through, you know. She married one guy, then another guy showed up, and then another guy showed up. And then I gave her back the guy she married through the help of you, you know. So this thing really got my attention. And uh, alcohol, well... My relationship with my wife and Alcoholics Anonymous are the two things that I did the best that I could possibly do in my life, you know. And if it wasn't for Alcoholics Anonymous, nothing would be. I wouldn't be here. We wouldn't be together. So uh, if you're new out here, uh, I didn't see a lot of hands of newcomers. Uh, I want to tell you, if you're new, 
you have what we call the alcoholic brain. Just don't use it for a little while. <laughs> That's kind of what got us here, you know. I had an alcoholic brain and I didn't know I had it, you know. Uh, I, I'm kind of here by accident, to tell you the truth. Uh, I drank normally for many, many years. I never got to the fun with problems part. I just had fun with, with booze, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Until something major happened in my life that I didn't know how to handle. And it's what we in Alcoholics Anonymous call that a resentment, you know. And I had a doozy. I had a real doozy, and I nur nurtured this resentment. And uh, today I thank God for it. You know, I really do thank God for it. So let me let me go back right to the beginning. They said I could talk for an hour and a half or so. Like, <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> you can start leaving anytime you want to, but... I wish I was funnier, but my story is basically sad, you know. <laughs> uh, I started at the beginning, though, because I had no alcoholism in my family. You, know, you hear a lot in Alcoholics Anonymous about people that get here because they had parents that were, you know, my parents didn't drink, my grandparents, my granddad, once in a while he'd have a couple of beers, but there was no drinking. I did this all myself, and I'm kind of proud of it because it worked out good, you know. But... uh I come from eastern Pennsylvania. Uh, there's a, an area in eastern Pennsylvania where it's coal mines and uh, Bethlehem steel, you know. And I grew up in a, in a family that was immersed in the church. My mother was the church secretary, my father a deacon, my grandfather an elder, and my sister, my brother, and my grandmother sang on the church choir. The best I could do was to steal money out of the collection plate, you know. I had 13 years of perfect attendance, Sunday school and church. So they give you a badge, and then they put all these bars under it for each year. You know, I used to walk with it, lopsided. It was so long. But, you know, I was a musician, and since the time I was 13, I was playing in the clubs. They, back in Pennsylvania, they call them gin mills, you know. So I was playing with these old guys, 40 years old, and here I am, 13, and one night one of the guys says, get the kid a drink. And they brought me this red fizzy thing. So, you know, when you're 13 years old, red and fizzy, yeah, slammed it down. And uh, so I'm probably here by accident because it was a slow gin fizz, but uh, I didn't run out and buy a case of it, uh, that's for sure. But, you know, when I put that drink down, it was like the missing link. Something just made me feel different because I was a little different because of the music that I had going on in my life. I was a, I was a fun kid. I mean, I was with all the right kids in school and loved and accepted, and, but I was always a little bit different, you know, and that, that drink just made all of that stuff go away. In fact, I had, I had so much fun in the 11th grade. They asked me to stay back a year and show the other kids how to have that much fun before leaving high school, you know. So, um, but, you know, my hometown, these guys would get out of the mines, the anthracite coal mines or the steel mill, and they'd stop at taverns. It was this harmless kind of drinking where you put in a hard day's work, and on the way home from work, you stop at the tavern. And for 35 cents, you got a little shot of Christian Brothers brandy and a short beer. And if you had another 15 cents in your pocket, you'd get a slice of hot bologna and a hard-boiled egg pickled in red beet juice. Now, after that, you had enough gas to fly to Cleveland, but, <laughs> but for five bucks, you could lose your car, you know. So, you know, I, I mean, I, a, a big Friday night when I was a kid in high school was like stealing a quart of beer out of some guy's cooler while he's in the back making your dad a crab sa patty sandwich and going out into the woods and guzzling this quart of beer with your buddies. Go to the Friday night dance and throw up on the girls, you know what I mean? <laughs> so it was all harmless and and so naive and everything. I, di I didn't really find alcohol till much later in life. And I should tell you this, so I know this is Alcoholics Anonymous, but, you know, today, I mean, every school, there's all kind of drugs and everything. We had none in my hometown. There was no pills, no pot, no nothing. Just no drugs whatsoever. 
that was it. Friday night, cooler, throw up on the girls. And that was about it, you know. So, <clears throat> so I finally get out of high school, and uh, it's Vietnam time. So they're about to draft me, and I heard about this uh, Navy music program they had. And if you go to Washington, D.C., and you pass an audition, you can be guaranteed to never have to carry a gun and shoot one of our own guys, you know. So I auditioned, and I made it in, and uh, now I'm in the music school, and they sent a cream of the crop band down to South America. I'm 19 years old, and we're down on a, a goodwill tour. Now, you slap a white uniform on a kid, put them out at sea for a couple of weeks, and then cut them loose on some foreign territory. We promoted some goodwill, I'll tell you. <laughs> so I'm still having fun. You know, like now I'm drinking some vino tinto and vino rojo and some pisco sours and all this fancy stuff. So no longer the shot in the beer. I'm just broadening my horizons a bit, you know. So uh, my last job in the service, I was... Um, they stationed me in the south of France. Pretty good, huh? South of France, and we were on the Admiral of the Sixth Fleet ship. And so we used to get up in the morning, we'd go to the, to the back of the boat, I call it. It's called the Fantail. But we'd go to the back of the boat, we'd play the Star Spangled Banner and raise the flag, you know. Well, all of the tourists that had the fancy hotel rooms around there made a complaint to the Admiral about, do you guys have to make that horrible racket at 8 o'clock in the morning or wherever it was? So the admiral says, no. Okay, guys, well, when we're in home port, you can have off four days in a row. We love that, you know. So uh, we chip together and get ourselves some a cheap apartment that we could share and everything. We had civilian clothes. And I met my wife during that time. Now I'm learning how to drink Chateau Neuf de Pop and some Nuit Saint Georges, you know, all of this fancy French stuff. She didn't even know I was in the Navy, and um, we met, we fell in love, and uh, still broadening my horizons. It's all good, it's all good, No, nothing, nothing to pay back yet. And uh, so the end of my hitch, I was in four years, one month, 17 days, 11 hours, and 39 minutes, but who's counting? So it was time to go home, and, and I, I, we got engaged while I was stationed there, about a year and a half. And I said, you know, in two weeks I'm going home. She says, you're going home? Why? We just got engaged. I said, well, well, I'm done. My, my hitch in the Navy is, is over. You're in the Navy? <laughs> so anyway, I go home and uh, <clears throat> we start getting her paperwork together to bring her over to the States. She comes over to the States and uh, I went right into New York City to start my career as a musician, as a professional musician. And I get into New York, and I see, uh, I meet all my heroes, and these guys have needles hanging out of their arms. And they're so drunk they can hardly say their names, you know. I, I thought to myself, well, if that's what you have to do to make that kind of music, where do I go to get some, you know? So I was willing to do anything that, that I could do, and I landed this job at a famous old jazz club in New York, and... Uh, I was in there playing with my heroes. It didn't pay a lot of money, but it gave you a lot of exposure. So uh, that exposure led to some more stuff like recordings, where you actually made a few dollars. So pretty soon we'd finish working at 3.30 in the morning, and then we'd have a 9 o'clock TV commercial or a radio spot or something. But you have to get home, get to sleep, get up, and be ready to do it again at 9 a.m., so we'd show up at work in the morning, and I'll be damned if 9 o'clock in the morning the ad agency guys would bring booze and some other stuff for you, outside issues, drugs. And so uh, they'd say, now here's all you guys need, now give us the magic. So we did. We'd do a 9 o'clock, a 10 o'clock, and 11 o'clock. We'd do some TV commercials. You're only recording 60 seconds worth of music, so you're in and out, run to the next one. And then in the afternoons... We would do a 2 to 5 and a 7 to 10 record date where we were recording albums. Some of those albums that we made in the late 60s are still on the radio today, and some of us weren't even there. I mean, <laughs> by noon, you were half in the bag, you know. <clears throat> 
So now things are going good. My career is going really well. And then this guy from, uh, here's where the alcoholic brain comes in. Uh, this guy from London who was a major guy in the music world comes to town to make a record. And he looked at the 10 or 12 of the top drummers. I'm a drummer. He looked at the guys that were doing all of the work. And he just liked my attitude, my playing, and everything. So he, he invited me to do this record with him. Now, my career can't get any better than that. This is the tops, you know. So everybody's talking about where I'm at. And uh, about three months after the record comes out, soars to the top of the charts, he calls and he says, hey, would you and your wife like to uh, come over to England and just take a vacation and hang out? And I said, yeah, I'm, I'm up for a vacation because that pace was pretty hectic. So we go over to hang out with, with this guy, who's soon to be my, my, my boss, and he says, I miss my old band. He was in one of the biggest bands of all times. I miss my old band. Do you want to form a band? And I said, yeah, count me in. So I made one of the first mistakes, you know. I made an agreement on a hippie handshake. <laughs> It was done. It was done in those days. Knowing that millions of dollars could be around this scene, but hippie handshake. So we pack everything up. We move to London. We're in London. And uh, the band's touring. We're making records. There's millions of dollars floating around. And you know that Reagan trickle-down effect? <laughs> Wasn't trickling down. Uh, he had some other problems with his first band, legal problems and everything. And and all of a sudden, the drinking started to turn a little bit. The guys started coming over to my place after we were done, whatever we were doing that day, and we'd drink a little more, use a little more, whatever, you know. And it was getting nasty, and uh, we, were, we lived as a family, this band. It was really great, except for that, that end of it. So I'd heard a, another piece of bad information about how this money problem was going to manifest itself. And, and I used that alcoholic brain. It, the alcoholic brain told me, you're not a analyst, just leave. Take off. And I listened to it. Um, so <clears throat> I'm in London. There's a car in front of my place. Take me to the airport. We're going off to Lagos, Nigeria to make his biggest selling record ever. And, and I said to myself, I'm going to listen to this intuition that I have. And I called the man up and I said, you know what? I just can't do that. I can't do this anymore. Bang. And I slam dunked him. I didn't know it, but that night I gave birth to my alcoholism. Because that night I had a resentment that I nurtured for a really long time. It almost killed me. You're going to hear in here that resentment is the number one offender. It has the power to kill you. Resentment's like taking poison and expecting someone else to die. That's exactly what I was doing. So that night, after that phone call, I could no longer just have a sociable drink. Every drink I took at that point was, I'll show you, I'll kill myself, slowly. That's the brilliant mind of the alcoholic. So... So I didn't know it, but I was, I was on a pathway to some really ugly stuff that was to come. And today I thank that man profusely because without that situation, I wouldn't be here. My life wouldn't be what it is. But so anyway, I said to my wife, let's get the hell out of here. Let's get back to the States. New York is too fast for me. Let's go to California. Let's go to California. I want to play with the big studio orchestras that makes the movie soundtracks and all that. And, and uh, so I thought, where I just came from, everybody will know who I am. It'll be great. We'll be back into the swing of things. So we come to move to California, and California's music business says, you know, who the hell are you and who sent for you? Now I got two resentments. <laughs> so I don't know about you, but when I get a resentment, uh, I don't know how to deal with it. I, just, I didn't have the tools then, so I started drinking. I pour alcohol on it. When I pour alcohol on it, it just gets worse and worse. My wife started working. She started as a, a receptionist and worked her way up 
to vice president of Wells Fargo real estate lending, you know, like commercial lending or something. She really did great while carrying me all those years. And it was sad. It was, I, I would wake up in the morning. I drank in a bar up the street. I could not wait to get to, to this place with my lower companions. I used to like, one of my old things was I used to get up, roll up, throw up, and then give up, you know. <laughs> I'll try it tomorrow, you know, but I couldn't wait to get to this bar because I wanted to have my breakfast burrito and beer done by noon so I could be drinking, numb myself out, you know. And my wife found out that if she came home a little bit later each night, I'd be blacked out, passed out on the couch. That was the end of a perfect day for her, not to have to deal with my sorry but you know. So, uh... I'm drinking. It's getting harder and harder to stop. I'm working a little bit here and there. My buddies, there was this one buddy from New York, had a, a jingle company, and he used to call me. I'd go do a couple of spots at his studio. And as soon as I thought they were done with me, I would run back to that bar. I had to be in that bar numbing myself. A couple of times they called. They said, hey, is, is Denny there? Yeah, he just walked in. Well, tell him to get his ass back here. We're not done with him yet, you know. That, that's what it was like, though. And uh, I realized that I couldn't stop drinking, and I went to my family doctor. I have a family doctor who a lot of musicians went to in L.A. He played the string bass, you know, doom, 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 one of those guys. And Ralph was sweet. Most alcoholics do not tell their doctors the truth. But because he was a musician, I figured, eh, what the hell? What have I got to lose? So I told Ralph, I said, I, I, I think I have a problem with alcohol. He said, well, if you have a problem with alcohol, there's, there's only one thing that works. And I said, what's that? He said, Alcoholics Anonymous. What else you got? <laughs> Come on, I lived in France. I know how to drink Chateau Neuf de Pop. <laughs> I wanted to see how they signed that. <laughs> You know, it was, so I went back to that bar. Well, I, next, I said, well, I'll try acupuncture. <laughs> I tried acupuncture for a while. But it's funny how this disease keeps talking to you, and it keeps telling you you don't have a disease. It'll be different this time. Yak, yak, yak. So next I tried hypnosis. I was, you know, I wasn't willing to give up my right to get up and throw up in the morning, you know. I tried and I tried and I tried, and uh, finally I realized that there was nothing left but Alcoholics Anonymous. So um, my buddy, uh, no, let me back up. There was, there was a, something that happened before that, too, before I surrendered finally, but... Um, I'm playing golf. I took up, you know, when you're broke, what better hobby than to take up golf, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> I take up golf. And this famous disc jockey in L.A. hears that I'm learning how to play golf, and he invites me over to his fancy country club, you know? And if you want to have fun, just go with nothing in your pocket, feeling lower than a turd, you know, and go play in some fancy golf club. And... uh we're playing, and near the end of the round, I start feeling some weird feelings in my chest. You know, I'm saying, what the hell is this? And because I was honest with Dr. Gold, I went to him and I said, uh, hey, man, I, I'm getting these weird feelings in my chest. He says, oh, he says, you could have a problem with your heart. We're going to have to go see Dr. Steve. And I said, well, what does Dr. Steve do? Well, first of all, he's a piano player, so I trust him. <laughs> and he's a cardiologist. And I said, what do you mean cardiologist? You get a little nervous when they say cardiologist. So I go in to see Dr. Steve. He takes a look at me and puts right in the hospital. He said, uh, you know, Ralph told me I know how you live and all that. And he said, you could have a blockage in your heart. This could be some serious thing. So... He said, uh, they take me into a cath lab where they're going to do a, an angiogram. Just check out if you have any blockages. Now, well, on the way in there, you're awake for these procedures, but they give you some hospital dope. 
I mean, it was so good, I didn't ask him what it was. That's how good it was. But if they cut your damn leg off, you wouldn't care, you know. I was, I mean, they're laughing, we're hanging in the monitors and everything, putting this thing into your body and up into your heart and all this stuff. And he goes, oh, we found a major blockage. He said, you're lucky you didn't have a heart attack or a stroke. And I said, well, what are we going to do, man? He says, well, we're going to stick a balloon in there. This is before stints. This is 1986. We're going to stick a balloon in there, pop it open, and everything's going to be fine again. So I said, yeah, let's go for it, man. Come on, let's have some fun with this. And he said, don't worry, we got you covered. We got pacemakers. We got all this stuff going. And as he's saying that, the nurse says, he's going, he's going, he's gone. And I died for a minute. Just did one of those, you know. I think God was trying to get my attention that day, you know, like, hey, knucklehead. <laughs> So uh, they had never told me how long I was gone, but they brought me back, finished the procedure. I was only in for the weekend, and it was Thanksgiving. My wife and I were celebrating our 20th anniversary. And so before I leave to go home, my buddy had a little limo company, and he heard I was in the hospital, and he, he thought it would be a nice idea to send the car to take us home. So, so now I asked the doctor on the way out of the hospital, I said, Come on, man. You know me. What can I do? I said, what can you do? You just died on my table. What do you mean, what can you do? He said, well, you can never do that cocaine stuff again. Ah, I, don't, I hate that stuff anyway. I'll never do that. I said, but I am the creative type. What about that marijuana stuff, you know? He said, well, recent studies have shown that marijuana speeds up the heart rate. I went, Okay, I'll be careful. <laughs> I said, well, what about alcohol? He said, well, there's a new study out that a glass of white wine a day is good for the circulation. Went, oh, hallelujah. <laughs> so on the way home from Thanksgiving, 20th anniversary, near-death experience, I'm, <laughs> I'm in the limo, and there's a cell phone, a uh, car phone. There wasn't cell phones yet. And I picked up the, I had to use the phone. It was there, right? So I picked, called my dope dealer, but got a little bag of weed, and then I stopped at Vendome Liquor and got two bottles of circulation. I wanted to make sure I had that covered. <laughs> and then for the next, I don't know, four or five years, I had one glass of white wine a day, and I hit off the joint, you know. I'll be damned. Start burning that treadmill up in the doctor's office, and the disease starts talking to you again. Come on, man. It'll be different this time. You can do, you can have a couple glasses of wine. You can have a cognac after dinner. You're a gentleman. You can smoke half a joint if, you know, you start alcoholic brain. I started listening, and I knew it was on. I said, uh-oh, I think I'm out of options here. I better go back to the first thing he suggested, Alcoholics Anonymous. And I go back to my bar. I used to drink with this little comedian, Sandy. He's dead and gone now. He was my Eskimo. He brought me in. Sandy used to drink red wine, pineapple juice, and coffee. Awful, isn't it? Red wine for the buzz, pineapple juice to stay healthy, coffee to stay awake, you know? <laughs> Makes sense. And I saw that he left the red wine out. So I said, yo, Sandy, what's up, man? He says, well, I had to give up drinking. I'm going to AA. I went, uh-oh. So I watched him for a while, you know. And I said, uh, maybe you should take me to one of those meetings. I want to quit drinking, too. So he took me to the comedy store. He says, believe me, you'll feel right at home. It stinks of stale beer and cigarette smoke from the night before. It's dark and dingy. You'll feel right at home. And I did. So it was Wednesday night at 5 o'clock, a rush hour meeting, once a week. So I'm going to this meeting, I take a commitment, I start bringing food, and I'm there every Wednesday, and I quit drinking, which blew my mind that I could do that. Uh, I quit drinking, going to one meeting a week. Now, I didn't know that Alcoholics Anonymous is everything from the neck up, so I used to smoke a joint on the way in, and I had one rolled for the way out. It just made the speakers a whole lot funnier, you know. <laughs> 
But during those 30, 60, 90 days that I was there, I heard, oh, it's everything, everything. Wow. So now I had to go back to that meeting. I decided that was in September, October. And so like these, uh, I was sober like 90 some days and, and New Year's Eve came around and I said, I'm going to blow this out. I'm going to get sober January the 2nd, not because it's a day after New Year's Eve, uh, but because it was my grandmother's birthday. I thought that would be some true incentive. She was just the best. I love my grandmother. So New Year's Eve, I worked with the band. I said, I'm going to blow it all out. So I had 20 joints rolled up in a cigarette pack. I had a two-gram vial of blow and a bottle of non-alcoholic champagne. I wasn't drinking, damn it. (laughs) So I got up and licked my wounds on the first. The second, I started going to a lot of meetings, a lot of meetings, two, three meetings a day, sometimes more. I couldn't be alone with myself. I just not could not be alone with myself. The temptation was... So I'm sober... I think it was around 29 days when our San Fernando Valley had their convention. It was at the Universal Sheraton. And I'd, I had 29 days, and the women, God bless these women at Chandler Lodge where I got sober, they saw me coming in all crushed up and everything, and they really surrounded me with love, and they really they took care of me. And uh, So now I'm at the convention, and it's Sunday morning, and I didn't know that you needed a ticket to go into the spiritual breakfast. So I'm out in the hallway, and I'm about to burst with another resentment, you know. And the ladies see me out there, and they say, Oh, geez, we better save Danny, or he's going he's gonna to drink. So they came out to go to the ladies' room, brought one of the girls' tickets along, and they snuck me back into the meeting. Hallelujah. I've had, I made amends for that over time, believe me. Every year I buy an extra thing. But... Um, they snuck me in uh, this large banquet room, 3,000 drunks, and we sat in the back corner, and right in front of me was a table with a man who I'd seen at AA meetings, and I liked the way he carried himself in the group, and I knew that he knew what my problem was and that he had a solution for it. So I mustered up a little courage, and I asked him to sponsor me. I said, uh, I really need help. I'm 29 days sober. Would you sponsor me? At first, he said, uh, I don't know. I'm kind of, uh," and his wife gave him a shot. She said, Nancy, she gave him a shot. She said, you better sponsor that guy. He looks like he really wants it. And I did. I wanted it bad. He said, all right, I'll I'll sponsor you. I'll tell you what we're going to do, though. I want you to call me every day for seven days. If you skip a day, we're going to start all over again. Okay, I can do that. I'd like you to get up in the morning and just say a real simple prayer. I'm powerless. My life's unmanageable. But I know you'll restore me to sanity. So today I'm yours. Okay, I can do that. So we get on the phone. I call him every day. And some of you people up, he was quite popular up here in the Northwest. A fellow by the name of Scott. Uh, He was just... Handed me this. I get <clears throat> what that man did for me. He handed me this program on a silver platter. He really did. So <clears throat> I'd call him every day. We get to know each other and uh, say that prayer. And then I saw some guys that weren't sticking around. Scared the life. I was forty-seven at the time. Scared the life out of me that you could leave this thing, this gift. And uh, I found out in Alcoholics Anonymous that one of my main character defects is I'm a retaliator. If you get me, I'm going to get you back, you know. (laughs) And some old bugger got in my face and said, kid, you'll never do a four-step. You'll drink before you do your four-step. So I had to show him, so I called Scott up. I said, hey, man. I want to do this fourth step, he said, right on time. Come on up. So I think that's when my journey really began. Kitchen table, big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, pot of coffee, one drunk talking to another drunk. That's the miracle around here. 
Now, if you see one drunk sitting off in the corner talking to himself, stay away from him. (laughs) But that's where it all began for me. Scott says, okay, let's, uh, I'm going to tell you what, I'm going to read chapter 5 to you. And if there's anything you don't understand, stop me, we'll talk about it. So he starts reading chapter 5 like we read at most meetings. He goes through the A, B's, and C's, the three pertinent ideas, see that God could and would have sought. That's the key right there. God could and would have sought. Period. Say no more. So he reads on. We got page 63. He said, are you ready to take that third step prayer formally? I said, absolutely. He says, I think you are too. We got down on our knees, we locked arms, and we took the third step prayer formally. So if you're new in here or newer and haven't memorized that, I really strongly suggest you. That prayer deals with the condition of alcoholism. This is The disease of alcoholism is motivated by self and fear. When I'm not thinking about myself, I'm thinking about myself. I'm driven by a hundred forms of fear, fancied or real. If I don't have a real one, I'll just make one up, you know. (laughs) So I'm on my knees with this guy. God, I offer myself to thee to build with me and do with me as thou wilt. Relieve me of the bondage of self that I may better do thy will. Take away my difficulties. What are my difficulties? My difficulties are all the stuff I'm going to find out in this fourth step. Why? so they may bear witness to those I would help, thy love, thy power, and thy way of life always. Man, I finally understood that. It it was like beyond hippie deep for me. I mean, this is a real deal, man. Hippie, woo! So this dealt with everything that was wrong with me. I got off my knees with this guy that I just met, and I felt like something major had just taken place. I felt like my nightmare was over. I would never have to drink again. So, you know, it talks about it in the big book. It says, when we do this with a humble effort, an effect, sometimes a very great one was felt at once. Every time I've done this with a new man, I've felt that effect. It's a great effect. My nightmare is over. I can be here One day at a time. One day at a time. That's what we do. So he says, all right, now get some uh, paper out. We're going to make up these lists that they're talking about, the inventories. I said, all right. right." So he said, draw a line across the top and one down each side. He says, at the top, write resentments in big, bold letters. I said, okay, I can do that. He says, right, I'm resentful at the cause, and this affects mine. So he says, do you have any resentments? Geez, not that I can think of. I said, well, what about that guy in England that screwed you out of all that? Oh, yeah, him. Put his name down. Put his name down. Now, the next column is, what was the cause of the resentment? Well, he promised money for work. I worked. Or pay for work. I worked. He didn't pay. So, okay, that's good. Don't need him. A book about it. Yeah, that's great. That pinpoints it. So he says, now, in the next column, is how did you, having this resentment, how did it affect you? He says, what do you mean? I mean, I was doing great in New York. I owned the town. I was rolling high. He says, look, we're not taking his inventory. You're the drunk here now. We want you to be tough on yourself. Did it af- look on the bottom of page 64 of our big book? He says, when we're in this phase of resentments, it affects our self-esteem, pocketbook, ambition, person, relationship, and sex. Did it affect your self-esteem? Bang. Yeah, I thought it was a loser. Did it affect your pocketbook? Were you listening? <laughs> Did it affect your ambition? Yeah. Next band I'm in, I'm going to get screwed again. Did it affect your personal relationships? Well, I couldn't even say this man's name name without MF behind it. Did it affect your sex? I said, everything does. He goes, great, you got a five-bagger right there. (laughs) Just think about it. You're pissed off. You're in a resentment. Your self-esteem, pocketbook, ambition, personal relationship, or sex are tied up in it. You're kind of busy. 
There's no time for fun anymore. You're tied up in this evil, this hate, all of this stuff, you know. So I'm saying, wow, I can I can dig that, you know. So it was starting to make sense to me. Now he says, now I want you to turn that paper over. Well, I got a little leak problem here. He said, I want you to take that paper, turn it over, and on the top write, now what is the fault in Denny that if God would come along and remove it, he would no longer have the resentment? What's the fault in me? Remember, this is your inventory, not his. So I said, all right, let me take a look at this. Okay, I guess I'm in a situation where there's millions of dollars floating around. All I got is a hippie handshake. I don't have a contract. I don't have an agreement, nothing. I guess that would make me irresponsible. Great, it was my first character defect, irresponsible. Why am I irresponsible? It's because I'm afraid to go to the guy. Fear of confrontation. When I get into fear of confrontation, then I, the br- brilliant mind of the alcoholic shows up and says, well, I know how to just freeze him out of your life. Silent scorn. Now I'm in silent scorn. And I said, that's not enough. I got to retaliate. So I might go to emotional blackmail and start messing with him, you know? Now I'm in emotional blackmail. Then I go to character assassination. Then I'm on a roll, man. That's the way this thing works with this alcoholic. So one entry on my fourth step, and I'm learning all of these truths about myself. You know, I took that, well, I took that home and worked on it five or eight months. I don't remember. But then I went on to the fear list. And the the fear list is, uh, you know, it can take 10 seconds or 10 years to write your fears down. And uh, the big book is very explicit about it. It says we're driven by 100 forms of fear. So take a look at some of the stuff we're afraid of, you know. And one of my favorite sentences in the big book is on page 67 or 68, either at the bottom or the top, it says, when we ask God to remove them, this says, when we ask God to remove these fears and turn our attention as to what he would have us do or be instead, the next line is my favorite. It says, if we do this, if we ask God to remove our fears, immediately, immediately, we commence to outgrow the fear, not poof, it's gone. We commence to outgrow the fear. It doesn't have the power to send me back to that bar that I used to drink at. Then the, the third list that we had to make was the sexual inventory. And um, they put that on 69 so it's easy to find. <laughs> oh, I got to stop doing that. So, and, you know, that sexual inventory is great beyond a, uh, just a sexual inventory. I and mean, a lot of us get here with some stuff we're not too proud of, but it really, uh, it's a great inventory for business, relationships, healthy relationships. It's a great inventory tool. We just ask, where was I selfish, dishonest, or inconsiderate? Uh, selfish, <laughs> dishonest, <laughs> inconsiderate. Come on, pen, stop. How could I have unjustifiably aroused suspicion, bitterness, or jealousy? My wife knew that when I left to go on a concert tour like Japan or Europe or somewhere, put alcohol in me and anything was possible. So, yeah, I aroused some suspicion, bitterness, or jealousy. So I had to address that, too, because what I'm trying to do is get these three things that are the majority of alcoholics have these three things, you know, resentments, fears, and unsolvable sexual problems. And once we find out our part in them and we ball them up and hand them off to God, it gets better. That's what I'm doing. This is the step. They talk about it being the step to freedom. They even talk about it as, as building an archway through which to pass a free man. That really appealed to me. That really appealed to me. So here I am, I'm doing all this work on myself. I'm starting to, to see all of this, this stuff that's been killing me, been killing me. And uh, I get done with it. I call Scott up, and I go up to the house, make another appointment. <laughs> Big book of alcohol, synonymous pot of coffee, one drunk talking to another. We uh, read a different chapter this time. We read chapter 6, Into Action. 
We get on our knees, we do the third step prayer, bring God into the room, and I read in my inventory. And, uh, you know, we laughed, we cried. He dozed off a couple of times, but <laughs> I told you I was boring. <laughs> uh, you know, we got done with that. And I think t- two of the best words that you're going to he- hear in Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, especially after hearing some heinous inventory of some poor person's life, the two most powerful words that we have to offer them is me too. So uh, I knew that uh, I had to get home, start talking to God, the big boy steps, six and seven, you know, Father, please remove this horrible fear of the, please remove this horrible character defect that's serving me no use, Uh, do some prayer, 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 and then seven, meditate and wait for the answer, I've developed, through this process, I've developed a relationship with a higher power that he doesn't talk to this, the alcoholic brain anymore. He talks to this. That's the journey from the head to the heart, you know. And so I'm just, like, overwhelmed with all of this great stuff that's going on. I said, wow, I did my eight-step list. Put all, Just everybody on my fourth step showed up on my eight-step. Imagine that. Then I obviously hurt some people that weren't on any of those lists, put them on there. I started setting out about my amends. So I go back to Pennsylvania. Hey, why not start with your family? Uh, My family, you know, they were crushed by some of the stuff that I did when I was home. You know, I was the only alcoholic in the family, and uh, they were worried, constantly worried. So I go home. First thing I do when I'm traveling pick up the phone, and uh, find out where the AA meeting is. Now, you can guess where the AA meeting was in the church that I stole money from, right? (laughs) So I'm in the nursery room there. I was brought as a baby. And there's like these founding fathers' pictures on the wall, and my granddad was on there. And I said, uh, I'm making amends to my granddad for the way I tended bar at his funeral. Now, we didn't have bars in my house. But when my granddad died, there was a bar there because I was drinking. So I was making amends for that. Then uh, Sunday morning, went up to the church service. And when that collection plate came through, I had to pay all those quarters back. I used to steal a quarter and go across the street and have a smoke and a Coke, you know, wait for Sunday school to be over and then sit in church. So, So I had to pay all those quarters back with interest and without a note. (laughs) So all of a sudden they see a big bill in the collection plate, you know. And after that church service, I went up to the uh, cemetery to make amends to my dad, my grandmother, my grandfather. They had already passed. So uh, we drove up to the cemetery. I got out of the car. I walked up to their tombstones, and I lost it. I just wept like a baby. How could I take such a beautiful life that was given to me and mess it up the way I did over a beverage. And I was so ashamed of myself. Came home from that trip knowing that I better get a little bit busier in Alcoholics Anonymous. So I got home, more commitments, more meetings, started sponsoring men, doing all of that stuff. Now, things are going pretty good. My mom calls me. My mom says, uh, the doctors have just, she had a couple of pains that they didn't know what was. The doctors think I have an aneurysm in my aorta. They think I've had it for a long time, and they think that it may rupture and I'll die. Uh, So they want to do a surgery. I'm scared. I said, well, mom. If only you were an alcoholic. We have ways of dealing with fear, you know. And she said, really, what do you do? And I said, well, we write it down, ask God to remove it, and immediately becomes less. So she said, okay. So I talked to her every day, getting her ready for this surgery. She had a big team of doctors at Penn University Hospital in Philly. So she was all ready for the surgery, and I'll be damned if the, the doctors had to postpone it for 30 days. She went to absolute terror again. I had to give her the best that you guys give me every day. 
got her ready again, flew home. My sister and I were there. My brother couldn't get down, but we kissed her goodbye, wheeled her into surgery, thinking that, you know, it's going to be rough, but it's going to be okay. She's got the best. She didn't make it. It was too brutal of a surgery. So um, it really came to a shock. And we really thought she was 74. We thought she'd make it. So we're up at the house the following day, and we're planning for the funeral. And, <clears throat> and I find this diary or journal that she kept. And in it, it said how her son and his wonderful program of Alcoholics Anonymous made the last days of her life so much better than they would have been. Talk about being overpaid, you know. So that next day, I, I was with my mom. I was the last person with my mom in a funeral home, and I had my five-year medallion at the time. I took my medallion, put it in her hand, closed her hand, closed the coffin. I want to remember where I left that. I don't ever want to go back to that way of life, you know. The next morning, we put her in the ground next to her, my dad and her parents, and I stood there a different man, totally different man. It's because what you guys made out of me. Now, coming home from that trip, I realized, geez, now i got to make amends to that guy in England, and i got to make amends without asking for the check. <laughs> I was having some problems with that part, believe me. And Dr. Paul, uh, Dr. Attic Alcoholic, you know, Dr. Paul was a dear friend of mine and became my grand sponsor the last two years of his life. He helped me with a lot of spiritual stuff. When the resentment would come back, he sent me to a, a book, uh, a, uh, Emmett Fox Sermon on the Mount. And in there, there's a prayer of forgiveness. I had this resentment. It would just keep coming back after I did all of the AA stuff, but it would come back and make me feel miserable again. He showed me some sp other spiritual tools. So there's plenty of spiritual tools available to us. So anyway, <clears throat> where was I now? <laughs> uh, I'm, I, I'm realizing that I got to make amends to this guy. And I turn on the television one morning and I see on the television that my old boss just lost his wife to breast cancer. I knew she was sick, but I didn't, nobody knew she was that sick. Now, here's a man that I really had a problem with, didn't speak for many years. I heard this news, and the first thing I did was pick up the phone and call him. I'm so sorry, man. I, I had no idea where that came from. I had no idea where that came from. So we talked, we talked, and what can I do to help, you know? What can you do? So we went to, we, there was a memorial being held for his wife a couple of months, a month later or something. And I'd made amends to this man. I sent a letter. You know, sometimes you don't, you can make amends without knowing whether it's accepted or anything. I even talked to him once, but if it's not an alcoholic, sometimes they get the wrong idea, whatever. So now we get an invite to go to his wife's memorial in New York. And I say to my wife, I said, well, we have to go because it's part of my amends. They won't even know we're there. Sit in the back of the church. Everything is going to be fine. So we go to the, uh, to the memorial in New York. We're ushered in, sat up right across from the family. And afterwards, we had a long talk. You know, we were a family. We were a family. We had a long talk. And now we waited a couple of months to see how he was doing without his long-term partner. And then we went over to England to see how he was doing. And we spent some time with him in England and the kids and everything. And he says, well, you know, we're thinking about reissuing all the music that you made in the early days and make a documentary movie out of it. I said, great, what can I do to help? That come out of me? <laughs> and he said, well, didn't you used to have this little video camera back in the dressing rooms and backstage and all that. I said, yeah. He said, you still have that footage? I said, yeah. He said, can we use it in the film? I said, yeah, sure. So I sent it to him, and he sent me a little check. It was great. You know, I didn't have to ask. It was a little check. but <clears throat> So now I'm starting to see promos for this thing. Wow, this might be a little bigger than I thought it was going to be. Uh, <laughs> 
So I called my buddy at the record company. I said, hey, what do you think this, you know, people bought it 30 years ago. Why are they going to buy it again? He says, well, we're not sure, but we're shipping 2 million units tomorrow. Oh, no, I can't watch this money go by again. <laughs> so I'd had a new sponsor by then, and I asked my then sponsor, I said, hey, man, what do I do about this? He said, well, if I was you, I'd write a letter to the man stating what you were promised, what happened, and how you feel about it. I said, I can't do that. He said, why can't you do that? I said, because I made a deal with God. I said, just don't let me drink again, and I don't care if I ever see a penny from that period of my life. He said to me, he said, this is really good. He said, well, you got to remember, God's old and he moves slow. <laughs> I said, yeah, you got me there. All right. So, um, so I kept working on this letter. I took a few passes at it to get all the poison out, you know. <laughs> and I got done with it. And, um, read it to, if you're ever going to do this amends letter, by the way, uh, or the, read it to your sponsor before you send it. It's all, always, you know. So I read it to my sponsor. He said, I think you said what you had to say in a loving way. Why don't you see what God's got to say about it and then send it off? Okay. So I did some prayer and meditation on it. <clears throat> Something hit me in the heart. says, I think God wants me to send this. And I mailed it. I know the man opened the letter, read it, picked up the phone in tears. He said, Denny, I'm so sorry. That's all I needed. I'm so sorry. I had no idea my business people rolled over you with, you know. Went, wow. I'd almost killed myself over this. We talked, we talked, and he said, how did you live with this for 28 years? I went, not very gracefully, you know. <laughs> so at the end of that conversation, he said, you know, I'm, I'm going to make this right. And he did, you know. I gave him a chance to make his amends, not just to me, but with some of the other guys in those early days, you know. <sighs> Who would have thought that what brought me here would come full circle through a few simple steps, through a con artist and a proctologist, <laughs> Dr. Bob and Bill Wilson. I mean, give me a break. <laughs> Bob had a drink of beer before he went up your butt in the morning. And Bill was such a mover and a shaker that he was close to being a con artist, the way he promoted the big book and everything. Who would have thought that millions of people would be alive and well and happy because these two guys met? How perfect is it for a club like we got here, you know? <laughs> so it's it's just amazing. Uh, Dr. Paul used to end, I'm going to shut up now, I've been talking way too long, but I can't tell you how thrilled I am to be here with you guys. Uh, I'm always, I'm home. So, I could have missed it very easily, very easily could have missed this whole thing. What a gift, what a gift to... Uh, Paul used to end his talks with saying, if you're new or if you're old, I hope you have a good case of alcoholism. Because <laughs> it's the only disease known to mankind. When you catch it, become a better person. <laughs> what a deal. And all we have to do to keep it is to give it away. This is my way. Well, I'm blessed to be able to give it away like this and just carry the message of what the steps did to me, what they did to this poor sod, like they call him in the book. <clears throat> and this disease, is, there's no other disease that absolutely insists that we be happy, joyous, and free. Give me a break. I couldn't figure that. I still have bar tabs in the valley. You know? <laughs> but over time, happy, joyous, and free, for me, became that fourth step. Resentments, fears, and sexual conduct. That was it. It was a simple equation, but it took me a, a little longer than most to see it. But it, besides being the step to freedom, 
it allowed me to forgive myself. Forgive everybody else first. I'm last on the list, but I forgave everybody else. Then I forgave myself. An old timer told me, he said, God's forgiven you or you wouldn't be here. Stop slapping him in the face. And it made a lot of sense to me. So God couldn't would have sought. That really is the bottom line. Sandy Beach used to say, if you can't find God, you're just screwed. <laughs> I love it. Sandy was talking about, he was talking about a kid. He was some newcomer sitting on the steps outside of a meeting. He said, Hey, let me ask you something. Do you ever uh, read any spiritual material? He said, ah, I wouldn't do that. He said, uh, how about, do you ever go to church? He said, ah, hell no, I'd never do that. A couple more things like, kids, no, no, no. He's, so Sandy looked at me and says, so how's it going? <laughs> we know how it's going. Because this is a surrender. It's a daily surrender to a way of life that I never dreamed was available to me. I'm thrilled to be a part of this thing and uh, it is a priority in my life and it's and it's because I get to do this and meet people like you in places like this. Thank you very much for listening. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.